This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham. This is the Chris Abraham Show. This is Season 5, Episode 27. That is uh, Episode 27. And I'm just popping in because I saw the first interview of Tucker Carlson since he was fired by Fox. And that interview was conducted by Russell Brand. And it was just, uh, it was just, you know, a bunch of confirmation bias and affirmation bias. Just a bunch of, like, huh, that's what I thought, huh, that's what I thought, huh, that's what I thought. And uh, it was very entertaining. It was, you know, I don't know if I support or don't support the nudging narrative of the current, you know, Western hegemony in terms of its imperialism, both warmongering abroad, um, being the most colonial country in the world, while without blinking telling every country that America has colonized, along with Great Britain, that it is in fact a free democracy to the point of us having between 800 and over a thousand uh, quote-unquote bases in sovereign countries, whether it be military bases or intelligence bases or collaborative State Department, I guess, embassies and so on and so forth. So... With that being said, it was just a pleasure to sit there for an hour and listen to Tucker Carlson chat with Russell Brand. These two men are, I think, at an opposite, opposing part of the horseshoe, of the liberal and conservative horseshoe, and yet they are fast friends. And why is that? The most important part of the interview was the fact that the concept of left and right has either broken down or become, have discovered more in common with each other vis-a-vis the horseshoe of populism, where extreme left and extreme right have more in common and hitherto have found enough separating them that they're unwilling to agree on anything, even though they agree on everything. For example, all of my extreme leftist friends never took the shot. All of my extreme rightist friends refused to take the shot. Um, My extreme leftist friends want to eat fresh, whole, organic, unprocessed foods, and my extreme rightist friends are obsessed with fitness, health, organics, and a lack of processed foods. My extreme leftist friends try to find plant medicine as a way of being healthy. Um, Plant medicine can be, if you will, Eastern medicine. Um, Did I ever tell you that when I lived in Germany, Germans really tried to steer you away into holistic solutions rather than uh, medical solutions? I feel like the left and the right agree on one thing, which is they are trying to remain out of the pocket of pharma, out of the pocket of processed foods, out of the 
out of the pocket of pharmacologicals, um, out of quick solutions such as Ozempic, um, into, they both seem to often agree uh, when it comes to solutions such as, I don't know, I forgot the term for, uh, for kind of a, te- uh, a type of self-discipline and temperance that is more interested in personal choice and personal agency and kind of, I feel like they've embraced libertarianism and even um, anarchism over libertinism and self-indulgence and both the extreme left and the extreme right is really anti-tyrannical and anti-autocracy. In other words, while theoretical I, meaning Russell Brand and Tucker Carlson, said the following, I feel like, and by this I'm quasi-quoting Russell Brand and Tucker Carlson, while I want to have complete agency and autonomy, over raising my children with an asterisk that says that abusive families who abuse their children should not be included in this. I also need to believe that if I'm allowed autocracy, sorry, autonomy and agency and independence when it comes to how I raise my children, I also need to accept the fact that I cannot tell other parents how to raise their children. Because when I say I want autonomy and agency in terms of how I raise my children, that has the other edge of the sword, which is to say I have no agency or control over the way other people raise their children. I agree with that. I chose not to have children, so I don't have to make that decision. But I believe that my only attachment to libertarianism is because it's a signifier that lets me tell everybody else that I am willing to cede to you your full autonomy and agency under the understanding that I get my own agency and autonomy and if you try to influence me or tell me what to do I will respond very badly and very dangerously but only if you try to intervene in my autonomy and intervene in my agency. And I think that this is what I loosely define as populism. Um, But it's a messy word because I use that word only because it inflames people and pisses people off. But what I really mean is the fact that um, Tucker Carlson, or maybe it was Russell Brand, they become like the same person in my head for the purposes of this conversation, did say one thing, that autocracy and um, authoritarianism in America now is defined as centrism and that the left and the right are any and all things that do not agree or what is the term, do not assimilate with what the centrism is, which is what is called leftism, but is in fact centrism, and is in fact American authority, American authoritarianism, and um, American, not dictatorship, but 
I mean, surely authoritarianism, and surely that if you do not agree with a narrative, you... I mean, one could call it fascism, but one could call it fascism with a lower case, which is authoritarianism. Um, always, always, always question someone who believes that uh, that fascism needs to only be uh, clothed by Hugo Boss. That if you are not a blue-eyed, blonde-haired um, uh, Ubermensch uh, with a German accent, German ethnicity, and uh, if you if your concept of fascism is only defined as a jackbooted thug and not loosely designed, de de defined as any thug at all, um, it is really important to you know reconsider your your definition. I mean, what is your definition? What is your issue um, with needing to redefine what oversteering? I mean, if you need to be... One thing that Tucker and Brand agreed upon, which is it's not a... If your government trusts you... If your government distrusts you and if your government, if, sorry, if you distrust your government, if a huge population of 71, 71 million people distrust the government, distrust the vote, distrust the election, and distrust the entire idea of America being a democracy at all, and in fact fears that the narrative is already decided who becomes president, who becomes governor, who becomes senator, who becomes rep. If there is no way that you can force 71 million people into believing you, the more you try to force 71 million people into believing you, the more you reaffirm to those 71 million people in growing that this is in fact a what is it called a um, a banana republic that this is in fact a puppet government that this is in fact a kabuki dance that this is in fact political theater and that Whatever your decision in the voting booth is mere formality as an indulgence, if you will, not unlike, uh, is it Maggie or Lisa? Maggie. Not unlike when Maggie is in the passenger seat of the car being um, driven by, I forgot what... It's, um, it's uh, Homer Simpson, and it's Lisa Simpson, and it's Bart Simpson. I don't know. Mona Simpson. Mona. I don't think I knew that. Voiced by Maggie Roswell. No, is it right? Marge, Marge Simpson, duh. Marge Simpson. So, so it's a, it's like one, of, it's one of the opening scenes in The Simpsons where they're driving in the car, and Marge, the adult, is driving the car, but Maggie, I assume, is a little baby is in her own um, in her own car seat and she has her own steering wheel and its own horn and she is given a belief she is she has the uh, the play she is she has no 
actual ability to drive the car. She has no input. She doesn't even have a voice. She's a an infant, a permanent infant. And but she has complete access to a steering wheel and she has complete access to a horn and she has access to a a type of driver's seat but the horn the driver's seat and the steering wheel are not attached to anything and that's sort of what 71 million Americans believe is the truth and uh, so Russell and uh, and Tucker were basically saying that you can't force those people into believing you. You have to you have to convince them through apology, transparency, honesty, and through apology, through um, actually deep apology. And uh and you have to win back their trust. But if you have nothing but contempt for your population, and if you've defined them as a bunch of MAGA Christo-fascists, you're not going to have any incentive to want to. You've completely dismissed at least a half of your entire population to the bin of history. And the funny thing is, is that the same people who want to rule America actually have passports and the what is it, cosmopolitan nature, and maybe other passports and the money associated with being able to leave. But the 71 million people who are dismissed as Christo-fascist, MAGA, extremist MAGA, super-Republicans, are actually neither Republicans, neither, generally speaking, crypto-fascists. The people who are MAGA-Republicans tend to be you know, populists way more than they're Christians. Most of them are, most of them have barely been to church. Mostly, most of them fancy Sunday where you go watch the game, not where you go to church with your wife or whatever. I would say that they're barely Christian. Um, they're barely traditional. I'd say a lot of them have, you know, babies, mamas, and, 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 um, oh, child support, and, like, are what, you know, would be the opposite of, of necessarily 100%, um, diddly do, highly ho neighbor. I would say that this populist uprising is mostly amongst the underclass is mostly amongst people who aren't anti-trans, they just don't think about it, aren't anti-gay, they just don't think about it, aren't um, anti-anybody, they just don't think about it. They have jobs that require sweating and wages as opposed to salaries and very little power and very little equity in the world. And they probably have a lot more in common with uh, poor black folks than Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or, to be honest, uh, Russell Brand or Tucker Carlson or anybody. And yet, uh, I believe that the uh, race war is a distraction so as to create as much of a divide between poor white folk and poor black folk and poor Indian folk and poor indigenous folk and poor Latin folk and poor Latino folk and poor immigrant folk and poor African folk and poor Middle Eastern folk and all the other folks who are underinvested in and who will never win the meritocracy wars and who don't even play in the meritocracy wars and who don't even care about the meritocracy wars. Most people who are involved in the meritocracy wars are going to end up in the top 20% no matter what. They might not end up in the top 1%, but they're certainly never 
if you if you prioritize meritocracy, then you're going to at least probably achieve a world where you can have a living. And you probably will have access to something and as opposed to nothing. And if you are in the meritocracy game, you'll probably be grateful for it and not constantly disappointed or unhappy. Um, I would recommend go seeing it. I think it's very interesting. I believe that January 6th is simply the the new uh, domestic 9-11. I believe that it was curated and populated and uh, staffed in such a way that it wouldn't... I mean, heaven forbid if it burnt down the Capitol building. You know, the worst thing that happened is a couple broken windows and a couple shit-smeared walls. I mean, honestly, if it were real manifestation, it would be um, the Capitol building would be perfectly burnt down. And the office buildings would be burnt down. And the entire Capitol Hill area would be looted. And something would have actually happened as opposed to basically violent tourism so because it was violent tourism it meant that the people involved had a modicum of respect and they weren't just going there with uh with guns ablazing there were no molotov cocktails there were just theoretical pipe bombs and theoretical bombs that never went off i i always believed that if something didn't happen then it was a fed narrative or a um, edelman narrative I believe that you can say stuff happened. You can say that AOC was killed. You can say that nobody was killed, nobody was tortured, nobody even got a bloody nose or a broken nail. Nothing happened. And yet a thousand people were charged and went to jail. Um, And, you know, uh, it'll result in the first U.S. president pass to go probably to jail. Uh, at least to uh, federal court, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was 9-11, but for um, not for the Patriot Act, which, you know, gives unfettered access to uh, the privacy of people around the world and pretty much access to break all international laws with regards to... um, to agreements that we've made with regards to um, what is and isn't torture, what is and isn't uh, crimes against humanity, what is and isn't um, uh, surveillance, what does and doesn't break the uh, Constitution, what does and doesn't break the trust of the public. If you can convince the public that their safety, their freedom, their democracy, and so forth, uh, demands the willful and violent suppression of fascism, Nazism, Christo-fascism, and tyranny, then you're a freaking maestro, man. If you can fight fascism with fascism, if you can, white, if you can fight despot- despotism with despotism, if you can fight authoritarianism with authoritarianism, and if you can put into official channels um, oligarchy in order to fight oligarchy, then bravo. The future of our world is definitely going to be safe, but the future of our world is going to be at the the price of liberty. Um, And on that note... Have a great weekend, and I love you, and I'll talk to you soon. Mahalo. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.